in. Let's open our Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Matthew chapter 2 this morning. Matthew 2 is where we're going to start this morning. Um, If you want a book from the bookstore that might help you with the sermon this morning, uh, this book here, Finally Alive by John Piper, about the beauty and the wonder of regeneration. Um, This is one of the best books I've read on what does it mean to be alive in Christ and what does it mean for the Spirit of God to make us alive. This book will help you um, probably more than anything else. And that's in our bookstore. There'll be a couple of those available at the table there, so you can go check that out. Uh, You know, I had one of those, I don't know if you've ever had one of those aha moments in your life, you know, one of those moments where you realize, um, you know, something that you've missed or you haven't seen in a while suddenly comes to fruition. You know, maybe if you're a kid and you're in math class, it's that moment when your math teacher's up teaching and suddenly it makes sense and you finally get it. Maybe uh, for some of you, you know, you've had one of those spouts with your, you know, one 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 of those battles with your spouse and you don't know what the problem is and finally it's like a aha, I finally see what the issue is, and you begin to see what's happening. It happened to me this week. I was listening to sports talk radio, which is one of my kind of my droning things to do in life whenever I don't really want to put my mind on much else. I was driving down the road, and this guy was talking about um, asking the, the person who's interviewing, have you watched any of the presidential debates? And the guy who's a lawyer, he said, you know, he says, I, I just have to be honest with you. He says, now just listen to what he says and listen to the line of thinking. He said, I'm just looking for somebody presidential. I can't find it on either side of the aisle. Really what I want, I want a guy who's going to ride in on a white horse, save the day, and be a real president. And I'm just in my mind, I just said to myself, aha, the whole world is looking for Jesus. The whole world's looking for Jesus, right? I mean, that's really what we're hoping for. We really want Jesus to be seated on the throne. And all of us have had some of these <clears throat> aha moments, these moments where you just kind of walk away and you go, okay, now I finally see, and I see what the reality of the challenge is before us. And some of those moments are awesome, aren't they? I mean, when you finally see what the issue is or what the challenge is or what the solution is, it's really comforting. You might be at work and a project's really hard and things finally come together and you just kind of think, aha, this, this is it. I can finally see it take place. Well, for our sermon this morning, I just want you to go back to that first aha moment when you begin to realize, if you're a Christian, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who has come to take away your sin. I want you to go back to that moment, right? I remember that moment for me. Uh, I, I, I'm a weird guy. I remember dates. I remember times. My wife asked me recently, you know, do highlights in our marriage stand out to you as highlights in baseball games stand out to you? Because I can name dates and times and seasons and you know, the, the count and the situation and what happened in the moment. And, of course, my obvious answer as men was, yeah, you better believe it, baby. I remember every highlight of our marriage just like a baseball game. Okay, well, what about this moment? Oh, of course I remember that moment. And I'm trying to drone it up in my brain, right? So those aha moments were for me when Christ made it real. April 1st, 1980. Nine years old sitting in a sermon as this guy was preaching about going to hell, and I didn't want to go to hell. And he made it clear that Jesus Christ was the only one who could save me. And I remember a buddy of mine leaned over and he said, we were at, this, at a Southern Baptist church, which is just what you do. You know, everybody stands up, they sing the hymn, Just As I Am, without one plea. You know, everybody knows that song. And sing the hymn, you come down front, the preacher then talks to you about Jesus, and you respond to Christ. Ever been there? Remember that moment in your life? Maybe it's vacation Bible school. Maybe it's years and years later. Suddenly it's, oh my word, Jesus has come for me. And now it's real. That aha moment is what I want you to think about. Our text this morning is going to do something for us. It's going to answer a question. The question is this, how does that aha moment happen? How does it happen? How does that take place in somebody's life. How do we have aha moments and how are, how does it happen that now our spiritual ears, spiritual eyes, our spiritual hearts become convinced that this is the way of salvation through Jesus Christ? How does that happen? This morning we're going to read about an aha moment for some men from the east. So let's stand together and we're going to read Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Matthew 2, 
1 through 12. If you don't have a Bible, grab a Burgundy Bible in front of you in the pew. We'll be on page 807. Here's what the Apostle Matthew wrote. He said, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his, we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written, it is written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. When Herod summoned the wise men secretly, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, Bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen went and rose, uh, when, it, when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with, his, with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Father, we believe that your word is true and it's inspired and it's God-breathed, and we want to receive it today as what it is, that it's truth. We want to humble our hearts before you, and we come, Lord, hoping and rejoicing that you're going to reveal Jesus to us again. Father, let us rejoice today in those moments when you open our eyes and you help us see. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, as we've seen in our study of Matthew, he wrote this book to help his fellow Jewish people understand the reality of Jesus. And One of the things that Matthew knew the Jews were burdened about was they were burdened about heritage and they were burdened about lineage and where people came from. So Matthew 1 was written from the angle of showing us the line of Jesus, that Jesus was in the line of Abraham, the father of the Jews. He was in the line of David, the great king of the Jews, showing the Jewish people that Jesus is indeed the promised Messiah that you are longing for and you're waiting for. But Matthew also knew that the Jews were concerned with Old Testament prophecies. The Old Testament prophets were, were like their, uh, their greatest leaders, if you will. Those pointing them ahead to what God would say to them. And that's why Matthew wrote in chapter 1 that the miraculous birth of Jesus by a virgin pointed the way that this is indeed the promised Messiah to come because he fulfills the Old Testament prophecies. His birth was not by accident. He is the God-man who God promised would come to save his people from their sins. So in this text that we look at today in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew is continuing to prove the same point. Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah that we've been waiting for all these years. And at the outset of the text, you're going to notice something that's a little unusual, especially for a Jewish writer writing to Jewish people. You're going to notice wise men from the east who come to Jerusalem, the capital city, to inquire of the king of the Jews at the time, which is a Roman man, King Herod, about the birth of Jesus, the king of the Jews. So they're coming, these men outside of Israel are coming into Israel to ask the Jewish people about the king of the Jews being born. Now, these three wise, or these wise men that we read about here are the wise men that we get that great hymn, we three kings who traveled thus far, right? We know that hymn. The challenge with that hymn is it's not entirely accurate. And the reason it's not accurate because there is no indication beyond the three gifts that are offered that there were three kings. There were potentially not three kings. There could have been a hundred kings or 300 kings. But there's also no indication in the text or from the Greek that these men were kings. 
Rather yet, these men were what we'd call students of the stars. They were magi or wise men, or we might even call them astrologers. These are men who looked into the stars and they observed, like most Eastern religions do, looking into the stars and believing that the stars pointed us to what was going to happen in the future and what's currently happening in the world. We might call them astrologers. They are people that were just simply students of the stars. And what they saw in the stars amazed them. Verse 2 indicates that they saw something that pointed them into Israel. Verse 2 tells us that they saw a star that indicated that the, the king of the Jews was born because you'll notice this funny little pronoun. His star rose. Meaning that there's something that happened that pointing them very clearly, so unusual in what was going on in the skies that made these men know the king of the Jews has been born. Now what they saw has been an object of much debate. Right? Some have said this was a great comet streaking through the sky and kind of landing in Israel. Some have said, well, because these men were potentially astrologers, they just pulled out their astrology charts and looking at all the layout of the stars deduced there was a, a certain special star that pointed to something special. But the text indicates that there's something specific that took place. Something that indicated to them this was a unique revelation that God was on the scene doing something remarkable. It pointed them to the fact that the king of the Jews had been born. Again, notice the personal nature of that pronoun. His star has risen. They recognize something took place, which leads me to believe that this was a special star or a special event that can't be described any other way to them. There's something unique that to them shined out and said, this points us to the king of the Jews. And now this, this type of language, something unusual in nature happening, would not be unique to the Jewish people. I mean, just think about their history for a moment. This is a group of people that when they left Egypt to go to the promised land, God led them with a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Meaning everywhere they went, they could see if God was with them or not. I would like that. Would you like something like that? That'd be a great experience. They're not, they're not, they're used to these nat, these, these, these supernatural phenomena happening. Not to mention there are a group of people that knew that in their promised land days, when they were going in to conquer the promised land, the Lord caused the sun to stand still for a full day. So they could do battle. Not, not unusual to them. It wouldn't be weird to them. When the tabernacle was built and they finally finished the tabernacle, the Bible tells us that the Shekinah glory of God, the, the unique, special, manifest presence of God filled the entire t tabernacle so much the priests could not even walk in there. There was a, a supernatural phenomena keeping them away from entering into this tabernacle, meaning and telling us the Jewish people knew these type of things happen when certain special events take place. That's what makes this event and this whole dialogue in Matthew 2 so remarkable. These men from the east gave indication this event that they saw in the stars was so overwhelming that it brought them into Israel for the purpose of worshiping the king of the Jews. And in other words, this was an aha moment for men of the east. We've got to keep this in mind. But I want you to look with me, though, at the response of Herod and the chief priest beginning in verse 3. You'll notice this is really intriguing language. It says that, Hebrew, that, that, that Herod was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. If you know anything about Herod the Great, you'll know that Herod was such a dictator and such a mean-spirited man that one commentator said, when Herod the Great trembled, the whole city shook. In other words, if there's something going on in the, in the throne room, all of the city is, at, is, is on edge. Now we'll see next week that Herod was troubled because he was jealous. Herod did not want anybody to take the throne that he had. He didn't want any other king to rise up to take that throne away from him. But just for now, I want you to notice how different Herod's response is compared to the response of the wise men. The wise men came to worship. 
Herod got depressed. The wise men came to serve the king of the Jews, but Herod begins to tremble in fear about losing something. But then notice with me in verse 4 the response of the chief priests. Now again, who are these people? These are the These are the experts of the Jewish law. These are the experts of of the customs and the prophecies. They knew these things like the back of their hands. They could quote them without even thinking about them. So when when they're brought the question from Herod to find out where would the Messiah be born, they just simply reply, well, the prophets already told us he'll be born, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. This small little town of seemingly no significance beyond the fact that that's where King David was born, Not a big deal to them. And then from the rest of the text, there's literally nothing else from the chief priests or the scribes. You get no response. There's nothing else to read about them until later on we'll read some things about these men and it's not all that good. I just want you to stop here and consider something with me. Here are the Jewish leaders, the people who are leading them. Their king, who yes, is a Roman, but is aware of the Jewish customs, And then their most religious leaders, their most experts in their Jewish religion, listen now, deducing through Old Testament prophecies where the Messiah was to be born. And here are these same men being inquired of by men from the East to say a supernatural phenomenon has taken place that shows us the King of the Jews has been born. Where is he at? And notice the response of these Jewish leaders is nothing. It's nothing. There's no passion. There's no extra research. There's no joy. There's no sense of of, of let's go find him. Let's go pursue him. Let's go to this king of the Jews. When you compare that to the wise men, it's shocking news. Now just skip down with me to verses 9 and 10. And see how far it goes with us. Because we're told, Herod then said to those wise men, hey, go to Bethlehem. So they do. And as they're on their way to Bethlehem, the star shines up again, lights the way, and stops right over the place where Jesus is with Mary. And these men get overjoyed. It says they have exceedingly great joy. Meaning that they're, they are beside themselves with excitement about what they're going to experience. And when they get to, to the house where Jesus was, what do they do? They fall down and they worship him. Again, just compare. Jewish leaders, dead, no no pulse, no spiritual activity except being troubled. It's as if just another day has come and gone where they've just been asked another spiritual question. They're like the Bible answer men, you know. Okay, here's the answer. Let me give it to you. Great, thank you. Have a good day. It's been nice to see you. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate the the, the greeting. Thanks for coming for our king. Uh, we're waiting for him to come. Uh, Herod then hears, hey, go to Bethlehem. When you hear about him, come back and bring me word. And then you got the Eastern wise men. Look at their response. They're alive. They're spiritually overjoyed. They are excited and they are worshiping. Again, they're having an aha moment. They're having that moment that you and I have had if we've experienced that moment. Now, what's the difference? Why? Why is there such a difference? Well, one reason there's a difference is from the purpose of Matthew's book. Remember what Matthew's doing now. He's trying to tell the Jews, Jesus has come and his work is for everyone. His work is not just for the Jewish people. His work is for Gentiles. I want you to notice something. This is the first moment in the book of Matthew where we find somebody worshiping Jesus. And is it a Jew? It's a Gentile. We see Gentile men worshiping Jesus, fulfilling Matthew's purpose to say, the king of the Jews has come and he has fulfilled what God's original purpose has been for us as a Jewish people, which is what? We're to be a blessing to every nation and that's Jew and Gentile alike. And here we see it in this text alone. This this is a prequel, if you will, to Paul's famous words in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, when he declared that salvation, that the power of God, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and then to the Greek. These magi, these wise men worshiping Jesus 
if you will, are the first fruits of the Gentile people and and leading into a long line of Gentile people worshiping Jesus. There are a long line of people, Gentile people, who will be at the throne of God, worshiping the Savior, being in the family of God. This would have been shocking news if you were a Jew. See, this is why you and I are here. We're here because these magi are here. We're here because we are Gentiles, outsiders, aliens who, who have been, who've been brought near to the promises and covenants of God through Jesus Christ. This is Matthew's way of saying Jesus Christ has come for every people group. That's why there's no such thing as racism in the Bible. You don't see it. You see those in Christ, those out of Christ. That's how God sees people. Those in the family of God who've trusted in Jesus, those outside the family of God who have not trusted in Jesus. And the beauty of Christ is he takes two, two enmity groups, enemy groups, Gentiles and Jews, and he brings them together under one head and makes them into one man in Jesus Christ. So that's one reason we see this. But there's another reason I think we see this in the text. And it's something that I want you to just keep in mind and something we've got to just draw it a little bit. Unless God opens eyes and convicts hearts of the truth of Christ, people will be left in the dark. I want to say that again so you hear it clearly. Unless God opens eyes and convicts hearts of the truth of Christ, people will be left in the dark. I want you to just notice something with me. These Jewish leaders could quote God's word. They knew it like the back of their hand. Yet their eyes were blinded. They couldn't see. These Eastern religion guys, these Eastern mystics, these astrologers, if you will, they were looking into the skies, and what did God do? God opened their eyes. They were now seeing the truth of King Jesus. How? How does that happen? It happens this way. Unless the Lord opens the eyes, we will not see. See, it ought not shock you that when you share the gospel and somebody hasn't had their eyes open, they don't get it. They don't get it. It should never shock us. Because unless the Lord opens the eyes, we will not see. Unless the Lord resurrects our soul, we will stay in our dead state and will not be made alive. We are all dependent. Every human in the world, in the history of the world, is dependent on this. God going to work and opening the eyes of the heart. See, this is where some people would take the wise men, and here's what they'd say. Because the wise men were seeking... Therefore, God showed them. That's not what the text says. The text says, God showed them, then they went seeking. See, let's get our verbiage right. There is a seeker, and his name is God. It is not us. You and I are not seeking after God. According to Romans 3, there is no one seeking. No, not one. There is one seeker and his name is God. And we see it in Matthew chapter 2 that God was seeking after these wise men, Gentile wise men at that, and opened their eyes to the wonder of Christ prior to anyone seeking after God. Listen, God is seeking after them. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. This means, listen, when you look back to your aha moment, can't you trace the hand of God in that? Can't you? And you know what that means? Here's what we have to understand. That salvation is more about God than it is about us. Are you aware of that? When the book of Revelation says, salvation belongs to the Lord it, mean, it means that. Okay? It belongs to God. When 1 Corinthians says that God has made salvation in such a way that no man should boast, it means that. That means for you and I, we, we don't simply look back and say, boy, I did this, I did that. No, we trace the hand of God at work drawing and wooing and enticing and convicting and then suddenly there's an opening moment and we see. How does that happen? That happens because the power of God has gone to work through the power of the gospel and opened our eyes and aha, we now see. Isn't that good? 
You know what that does to us as well? It provides hope and rest when we think about sharing the gospel with our friends, family, and our coworkers and our neighbors. You know why? Because God brings about transformation not by, not through our whimsical, witty, intelligent, strategic way of sharing the gospel. Right? We share it. God does the work. We speak it. God opens the heart. And all of us can remember moments. I've got hundreds of sermons I could tell you in these moments. When I preached the gospel, I thought I mumbled, blumbled, spit everywhere. It was awful. Left the stage and people come down and say, I, I got, I got to give my life to Jesus. And other times it's been eloquent. I've walked off thinking that was the best demonstration of the gospel in, in the history of Christendom. <laughs> and nobody responds. When Charles Spurgeon can stand at the front of an auditorium and just simply declare with nobody in the room except the window washer at the top of the ladder and just simply say, Behold, the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. And that window washer comes down, walks down the front and says, What do I need to do to be saved? That's the power of God. It's the power of God. That aha moment causes us to rest in this. Share it. Love it. Rejoice in it. Why? God is at work. And listen, this may be happening to some of you right here this morning. That you're becoming convinced in your heart that Jesus has come for you. That's a work of God. God showing you the beauty of this truth that Jesus Christ has come. So these are reasons why. That's what we see in the text. This is how God has worked in every person who's ever trusted Him. We see it in Matthew Blind religious leaders whose eyes were shut to Christ. Eastern Gentiles, far removed from the promises of God, became alive because God said, you're mine and I want you. I'm coming after you. Don't miss this. God is on the move everywhere. Everywhere. Through what? The power of His gospel. And what is He doing? He is opening people's eyes everywhere. Are you aware of the work of the gospel, how Jesus came dropped it on the earth, gave it to 12 guys, 12 guys gave it to 3,000 guys, persecution hit the church, then the gospel went everywhere all over the world, and it's still spreading since that day when Jesus first came. If you don't think the gospel's not on the move, you're missing the work of God in the Bible. He is at work everywhere through the power of God opening people's eyes. Now let's look at point number two, though, the fulfillment of Scripture in Bethlehem. Because we see this in verses 5 and 6 when the religious leaders answered Herod's request about where the king would be born. Matthew's inclusion, again, of Micah's prophecy is important because, as we've seen, Matthew is very interested in telling Jesus' story to Jewish people. So, to connect Old Testament prophecy is important to Jewish people. Um, to, To the normal American that doesn't really have much connection with any religion at all, it wouldn't be a big deal. We'd share it differently. We'd write the story a little differently. It'd be the same story. We'd just connect the dots differently. Matthew's connecting Old Testament prophecy with Jesus for the angle of saying He is our promised Messiah. Now again, we saw this in Matthew 1 when he talked about the virgin birth, that Mary was pregnant to fulfill what the prophet had spoken. That was like, talked about this last week, Spiritual clue number one. Well, now we're getting another spiritual clue in Matthew chapter 2 about the actual birthplace of the Messiah. It would be Bethlehem. If I could, I would take more time. I don't have the time to talk about how God uses these insignificant places and people to do something significant. Bethlehem's one of those. Now, what's intriguing about this is that Matthew... And just, just let this shock you for a moment. Matthew is using this to show the Jewish people, your Messiah has come. Yet in the text, who are the people that respond? The Gentiles. I find that remarkable. I find it remarkable that these, these wise men from the East are the ones who responded to this Old Testament prophetic utterance that God gave through the religious leaders. Now just follow the progression of events with me through the text, and let's just see if we can't see another little clue here. The wise men see something in the stars that leads them into Jerusalem, which would be the right place to go, right? Jerusalem is the capital city. It's a place to go. They think the king of the Jews has been born. Let's go there. So they go into Jerusalem, and they talk to the leader. 
The leader then goes to the chief priest who then has either reads or they quote from the prophet Micah, which is God's word, if you will. And the Lord then points the wise men to Bethlehem where they go and they enter there to do what? To worship this king. So here, here's what you see in this progression of events. God is revealing himself through words that are spoken by other individuals. This is remarkable news, and you're going to see a funny little work that God does, even through those that don't believe it in just a moment. But God is at work revealing himself through spoken words. God is a God who is at work to reveal himself to us by words that are spoken. You know what's intriguing about this is the Jews had the Bible in their own hands. Had it in their own hands. They could speak it from their lips, but their hearts were far from the Lord because of their own hardness of heart and because God had not opened their eyes. But these Gentile wise men, what do you see? God revealed His Son to them, not just by the star, but now by spoken word from somebody saying to them, go to Bethlehem. Let me give you another clue here. Here's the star. Put together the deduction of the natural revelation of God through the heavens are declaring the glories of God. He did this with the wise men. Where did it lead them? I've got to ask some questions of some religious leaders. Religious leaders open the book. When they open the book, what happens? God speaks to their hearts and they're now on their way to Bethlehem to go find this great Savior. God reveals Himself through spoken word. Now let's be honest here. This is no different than what God's done throughout history. How are the, how is the universe and the created things made? God spoke and it came into existence. In the Old Testament, when God wanted to reveal himself to his people, what did he do? He spoke through the mouth of the prophets, through the words of the law. And the means or the way that God brings people to himself today is through what? You and I, sharing or speaking the gospel message, the good news of Jesus to people. Why, why do, you know, people say all the time, let's just use our lives to talk about the gospel. The problem with that is, God told us to speak the gospel. So why does God want us to speak the gospel? Because speaking the gospel reveals the speaking God who uses spoken word to reveal himself. When we speak the gospel, the Bible says that God puts faith into hearts. What this means is, is that God is revealing himself through spoken word. Now just marvel at this for a moment. If God had chosen never to reveal himself at all, we would all be in the dark. But that's not what he did. He chose to speak. You wonder why John chapter 1 verse 1 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What is that? It's the spoken, literal Word of God coming in human form to speak again, if you will, about who God is. And what you have to love here in this text is God used the stars. He used the things in the skies, that what we call natural revelation to reveal there's a God, that God's done something unique and special. And then what does God do? He then He then lowers the boom by bringing Scripture to bear on what these men were looking for. And I love what happens next. And then, bam, where do you find these guys next? They're in Jerusalem. They're in Bethlehem worshiping at the feet of Jesus. This whole progression of events reveals to us that God is a God who is revealing his gospel, and he's going to reveal his gospel through a variety of means, but he uses spoken word to lower the boom. I mean, think about this. God uses the foolish to preach the gospel, right? God uses the selfishly ambitious to preach the gospel. You know what Matthew 2 tells us? God uses those who don't even believe the gospel to speak the gospel. That, that's remarkable. It's like the Apostle Paul would say, don't even worry about it. I'm just hoping the gospel's going to go out. You ever watch Christian Hee Haw on television known as TBN? And you just laugh and we go, oh, those guys, what are they doing? Every now and then you hear the gospel presented. And there's a part of you that just goes, ugh. Paul would say, I rejoice in the fact that the gospel's going out. And kind of shrug his shoulders like, yeah, I wish these guys were more righteous and they had better theology and they weren't, 
you know, it wasn't the blab it, grab it theology that everybody wants to have today, but it really is the truth of, you know, what the Word of God says fully. But even in that, God, because it's the gospel, goes to work in the heart. And that word, Jesus Christ became flesh, died on the cross for our sin, rose again from the dead, is now seated at the right hand of God. That gospel message has intrinsic, such intrinsic power that you and I can share it on our best days and our worst days and God still goes to work through the power of the gospel. This text, if you will, makes our hearts jump to say, do you see the power of the gospel at work that God goes to these eastern wise men and brings them to Jerusalem to point them to Bethlehem? That's a long, long journey, friends. And God is at work everywhere to do this. So here, listen, what do we do then? We love it, we believe it, we share it. Why? Trusting that God in heaven uses this spoken word to open the eyes of sinners just like He did to us. You look back in your aha moment, and what do you remember? You remember God drawing you? I remember the words that guy preached that Sunday. I remember the friend of mine leaning over and says, Hey man, Do you believe in Jesus? And I said, I I don't. I want to. He said, well, my daddy will lead you to Jesus. You want to go down front? I said, yeah, let's do that. I want to give my life to Christ. This guy led me down front, talked to his daddy. His daddy led me in the sinner's prayer. We all hear that. And my heart was ransacked by Christ. I remember the words that were spoken. I had a friend of mine that told me of a story of a buddy of his at a Led Zeppelin concert had heard the gospel outside the concert, went into the concert, saw the pot smoke coming down in the mosh pit, and and something went off and said, if you don't repent, you're going to die and go to hell. And the guy crawled out of the mosh pit, went back out and got saved. If God can use a Led Zeppelin concert, he can use anything. Right? Even though we could debate the music later, but my point is, you see what I'm saying? What, what, What do we limit the work of God too often? I don't know if I've shared it rightly. That's not the point. I don't know if I'm good enough to do it. That's not the point. The gospel has such intrinsic power that when we let it out of our mouth, it goes to work. Now finally, I want you to look with me at the gifts that these guys bring. Because these are these are phenomenal. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now these three gifts are what has caused people to deduce that there were three wise men or three kings. The problem with that, again, is the text doesn't tell us that. Right? It, it doesn't tell us there were three people who brought three different gifts. As we stated, it could have been three, it could have been 300. Bringing these three remarkable gifts. But here's the point I want to be concerned with is, if we reduce the three di- gifts down to just saying to us, this shows us there were three guys, we miss the point of the gifts. See, as you've heard me say so often, looking into Scripture, we're seeing things that are doing what? They're pointing us to something greater that's going on. Last week we did this. We did this when Joseph was this remarkably obedient man and Joseph was obeying God rather than the traditions of the, of the Jews. And we said, what did we say? If you'll remember, we said that Joseph's obedience and Joseph's following through with obe- obeying God rather than traditions revealed to us the type of life and ministry Jesus would live. Joseph was a type of Jesus. Well, guess what these three gifts are? These three gifts are prophetic gifts from the wise men revealing the type of ministry that Jesus is going to establish while he's on the earth. Process the gifts with me briefly. Gold was something that people longed for. Kings lusted over. They still do in this day and age. These wise men brought Jesus a gift fit for a king. Frankincense was used for religious ceremonies. We're used as well for medicinal purposes. It was like a resinous gum that they used to put on owies of people, and it was used to heal certain things. Frankincense was a gift designated and fit for a priest. But then they brought in myrrh. Myrrh is a really funny one because myrrh was was, was used and a spice that was used for anointing the dead for burial. It may seem odd, wouldn't it? You're bringing a baby, a gift for death. If I was that mom, I'd slap those boys silly, right? I mean, wouldn't you? Like, what, what are we doing here? 
I mean, this kid, hey, chill out, fellas. He's just now born. Leave him alone. Right? But this signifies something. That Jesus, they gave Jesus a gift signifying that he would die, which indicates to us his death is going to be significant. Now let's put these three together and let's see if we can't process what the Lord's saying through the text. King, priest, significant death as a man. All three of these roles that Jesus would fulfill while he is on earth. See, Jesus Christ, didn't he, when he came, establish the kingdom of God on earth, died, rose again, and has ascended to the right hand of God where he administrates as king over his kingdom. And he tells his people in Matthew 28 that they are to disciple people into that same kingdom. But Jesus is also our great high priest. We, we read about that at the beginning of our service. He's the mediator of a better covenant with better promises. He alone mediates between us and God. And He alone represents us before God as the God-man, Jesus Christ. And Jesus' death is most certainly significant, is it not? Because every high priest would offer a sacrifice for their own sin. Why? Because they were, they were sinful. Men who were sinners. And they would offer a sacrifice for the sin of others. But according to Hebrews 10, Jesus Christ offered himself as the perfect single sacrifice and died in our place. His death is significant in that it paid the penalty that we deserve and satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf and guarantees eternal life and eternal redemption. No one else can do this and no one else has done this. So here are these three gifts from these three from these Gentile wise men pointing to the type of ministry that Jesus fulfilled. He's the king. He's the great high priest. And his death is the sacrifice for our sins. You can't miss the gifts by just saying, this shows us there are three wise men. No, this shows us the type of life and ministry that Jesus would have. So you say, what, how do we respond to what we're hearing about these gifts I think, I think that the wise men give us great examples, don't you? They go to Bethlehem and worship. What, what, what should be our response as we've looked at Matthew now three weeks in a row? Our response is Matthew continues to beat the same drum. Can you hear the same drum over and over again? The Messiah has come. Jesus has come. What are you going to do with him? You can hear it over and over and over and over again. And listen, we're, we're, we're not even, you know, one fourteenth through the book. And yet we hear this over and over again. What will you do with this Messiah? And the response, according to Matthew 2, should be, we're going to worship Him. We're going to bow ourselves before Him. Listen, that may mean for you today, you become convinced Jesus is the Christ, and you've never even thought that. You've never believed it in your life. Today, guess what? Today's a great day to just respond to that and, re and return to Christ. Repent and trust in Christ. You become convinced He's the Messiah who's come to save you from your sins. Turn to Him. Or maybe, listen, it just is for you to step back again. And maybe you're in that dry season that life takes you through. And just marvel again that God opened your eyes. And look back again and marvel at the day when God drew you and called you and continues to reveal Himself to you. That He gave you that aha moment. That He's the God of heaven and earth. That He rules all things. And He'll use heaven and earth to declare that He is God and He is altogether glorious. You just need to step back and marvel at that today. Maybe it's just a fresh moment when you walk outside today again just to say, God, I am so grateful that apart from the grace of God, I'd be anywhere else and you have me here. Thank you. Or maybe it might mean that today's a day, listen, that you got to stop trusting in your false idols. You know what they are? They're comfort, possessions, money, education, sports, whatever it is, pleasure, and begin to realize this king has come to rescue us from our false idols. He has come to, if you will, to be established in our hearts as King Jesus that we might give him the worship that he deserves. But listen, whatever it means, the, the response is worship. 
The response is, we, we rise in a few moments and we sing some songs from the depth of our hearts because we have had that aha moment. We have been set free from the bondage of sin and like those, those Eastern mysticists, our eyes have been opened and we see Jesus clearly. And guess what we ought to do with that? We ought to worship. We ought to worship. So let's pray. Prepare ourselves to worship. Father in heaven, I, I'm just I'm aware this morning, again, freshly, of our need. I think of people in, the, in that dry season right now, Lord, and they're just battling. They just feel like that every time they open their Bible, that it's, it's just dust on a page, that every time they pray, it's like the heavens are blocked. It's like when they go to, to get to work in their marriage or their friendships or at work, <clears throat> everything seems to be stiff and hard and difficult and painful. And I just pray this morning that you would bring them back to that central, wonderful, beautiful moment that they would remember when you first opened their eyes. And Lord, that would provide for them a hope that you will do it again. And I pray you would. Help them to not harden their hearts, Lord. I pray for the person here today that doesn't know you. The Lord is today wrestling with this. Man, I, I believe this is true. What do I do? Lord, let them to repent and trust Christ. Lord, I pray for, most importantly, that our hearts would just sink deep into worship. That we would just rest and worship and adore you. That you have gone to work to save us that you have seen us and have loved us and have pursued us and have called us and have gone after us and you sent your son for us and you've opened our eyes, you've, you've taken dead people and you've made them alive, but by the grace of God, we have been saved, is what Scripture says. May we glory in you and in you alone. So Father, we, we just want to be people who worship today. We want to rejoice in you today. We pray this in Jesus' name.